in the last video, I told you that basic form of channels, which are called unbuffered channels, don't store data. They get it, blocked execution of everything until the receiver come and let it go. Next to the unbuffered channels, as you'd expect, we have buffered channels. Remember the example of giving a box to your friend. I said that in the case of unbuffered channels, you can't put it anywhere. You don't have any shelf or something like that. And you have to give it to your friend hand in hand. But in buffered channels, you don't have to give it to them right away. And you have some kind of shelf with a limited capacity. In the next couple of minutes, we're going to talk about it. For anyone who's not familiar with the term buffer, you actually see buffers everywhere, not just in Go channels. In software engineering, a buffer is basically a temporary place where we hold data before processing it. It's super useful when things come in faster than we can handle right away. So instead of losing new items, we just queue them up for a moment until we're ready. For example, in a doctor's office, this waiting room acts as a buffer and without it, we don't have any patient, which we don't want. Actually, we don't want patients at all. I'm trying to make a point here. Let's skip all this metaphor and get our hands a little bit dirty. But before that... Hey guys, my name is Parsa. Welcome to my channel. I've been a Golang developer for more than two years now, working in a ride hailing application which handles more than 4 million rides per day. And on this channel, I share what I know about different stuff. I hope it helps someone out there. And I really appreciate it if you support my channel because these videos may seem easy to create, but they're not. I put a lot of time and energy on them. So, yeah. Let's have a recap on previous video with a simple example of unbuffered channels. Let me share my screen. So it's a very simple example. At first, we create a channel of integer with the built-in method make. Then for three times, we create a new go routine, which wants to send a message in this channel. So as you might remember, the compiler gets blocked here until someone on the other end of it takes this message, receives this message. In the main channel, we wait up for two seconds. And after that, we start reading the message from this channel. Let's see the output together. So let's run this, go run. So at first we see that it sends message three, the message one, the message two, and then we get it in the same order. Now let's use buffer channels. In the first example, I want to show you that using buffers is sometimes faster. So let's put some timings here to have a benchmark for it. Start is colon equal to time. That's now. And at the end of it, we go for FMT print line, total time. And then we should use, I think, time since, do we have this method? Okay, start. So let's see how long does it take to execute to send all the messages. Okay, waiting for two seconds. And here the main branch, the main go routine receives them. So the total time is 20011897. And the thing is that this two is actually fake. I mean, we created it by ourselves. So the actual latency of this code is this one, is point is zero zero one one eight nine seven something like that. Anyway, well, before using buffer channels, we of course have to create them. Creating them is too similar to the previous one. It's too simple. We just come here when we are making the channel and next to this argument, we pass a number to it, which is its capacity. Now we have a channel with buffers. Now uh, let's see the output. So this is the output. As you can see, the message number two is received right after it is sent. So it doesn't have this waiting here. We can talk about it later. I mean, keep it in mind. So, and the total time here, it is one, one, eight, nine, seven. And here is one, nine, three, three. So as you can see, it's way smaller. Why is it faster? Because the blocking system in these types of channels 
are different from the type of channels which we saw in the last video. In the case of unbuffered channels, consider we have different go routines at different steps of what they are doing. So, and all of them want to send a message into a channel. And since we have unbuffered channels, they get blocked until the main go routine gets to them, reads that message, and they continue with what they're doing. And this thing should happen one by one. In the same scenario, but this time with a buffer, all these go routines which want to send a message to this channel put their message into a buffer and they continue with what they're doing all together. And after that, main go routine joins them. It doesn't block go routines here when you're giving a message into a channel. So our go routines just continue what they are doing. In normal case, when we are here, we wait up until the main go routine reads the message out of it. But here we don't have to wait up. But does it mean that buffer channels don't block at all? No. When does the buffer channel block the execution of code? When it's full. Which makes sense. It wants to say that I can't put some items on hold, but not every freaking item that comes to me. I can't take any new cases until further notice. Picture it as a lawyer, we just can't take all the offered cases. But otherwise, when buffer has capacity, the compiler doesn't get blocked either on giving in or reading out. There is an order of sending and receiving variables to this buffer. Well, this buffer acts as a queue, acts as a line. So the first item that comes in would be the first item that gets out. I mean, look at here. The first item is three, the second one is two, and the last one is the one, and they are getting out from the buffer in the exact same order. But not all data structures in the world of programming acts like this, so this one is a simple one, it's just a queue. Channels can be closed. Everywhere in software engineering, for any kind of thing, the deallocation step is a thing which should be at least considered. We may perform it, we may not, but if I want to be a strong programmer, I should definitely keep it in mind. Channels aren't exceptions. There is a built-in method in Golang which closes a channel. It says that I'm done with this, I'm not giving anything to it, and there is nothing else to read out. Let's first create a channel. The ch is equals to make a channel of integer. Let's make it unbuffered. We don't need that. So we create a new go routine in which for three times we push something to the channel, then we close the channel. For closing a channel, it's a very simple method. As per use, I mean, we use the close, that's it, and put the channel in it. We should put something here. Now that we know that channels could be closed, there's a variable which we should keep track of. And we create that variable when we read from it. It's going to be four, three times again. Next to the value which you want to read, we use another variable which is OK. Clone equal to now read out from the channel. This OK thing tells us whether the channel is closed yet or not. So we should, of course, check it if not, if not okay, I mean, when the channel is closed, just break out of it. So when we get here, we know that we're all good, the channel is not closed, and we can read our data. Let's here print line new item from the channel, and we put a value here. Sorry, that was for JavaScript. When we get here out of the for loop, we are sure that we break out of it here in this if clause. And when we get in this if clause, the channel is closed. So let's put a like here. The channel is closed. Now let's see the output. Okay, new item from channel, zero, one, two. After that, it says that the channel is closed. 
Uh, let's get back to the code. There are some points in it. Well, here we read out from the channel with two variables. This is a more common way. I mean, you see more of this in compared to reading with just single variable. But the other thing is that this if clause doesn't seem too good to me. It's not that beautiful. Golang has a feature for reading from a channel for each rating over the channel. And that feature is a syntax, which is range. Let's see how we can use it. We can comment out this one for the caps lock is on. Okay. For value range and then our channel. Now we don't need this one too. We don't need this. And we can just range over it and get the values. Let's see the result. It's still the same, but it is more handy and we have just one line of code. So how do we check if the channel is closed or not? If it's closed, we're gonna break out from this loop. I mean, it is handled on the back end of it. A pro tip, close the channel on the sender side. Be really careful when you're closing a channel. It's too error prone. Now let's go to the next part of this video. Well, we have tokens in the normal channels. We have them here too. It's a technique for programming concurrently. We use it when we don't care about the value of a sent variable and it's the existence of it which matters to us. We use it when we want to take place in something, for example, in a room or in a line. Let's solve a simple problem with it. First, let's define a worker method. It is called worker. It doesn't have to do anything complicated. It just has to print worker. Let's give it a number. Worker I started, worker are finished, and it waits up for like one second in between. Now let's go to the main function. Here at first we define a limit, which is three. I mean, actually it is not good to have real values in our code. I mean, we have three here, here, here. It's not good. We should do it like this. Let's call it SEM, which stands for semaphore. I tell you why I do this. So it's a channel. Of a struct. And its capacity is limit. So we'd have a for loop here from one to 10. And each time we push a token to this channel, and in a new go routine, we pass the i here, which is int. Here we call the worker method, pass the i to it. We take out the struct that we pushed here, and we pass the i here. This is the method signature, uh, the method body, and this is the input. So, I mean, we can put it like J. So we can understand the difference. Now let's sleep for five seconds and then type print run. All finished. Let's see the output. This is printf and this too. So here you see that worker one started, worker zero started, worker two started. After that, the first one finished, the third one started, and just like that. So we have like 10 cases, and for each one of them, we take a new worker. Well, in this code, we implemented a semaphore. It's a tool that helps manage controlled access to a shared resource in the concurrent systems. Let's put it more simple. 
it is like a traffic controller, which limits how many tasks can run at the same time. When the limit is reached, new tasks must wait until the running tasks finishes and frees up a spot. Other places where you may see buffer channels a lot are, for example, graceful shutdowns, background job scheduling, and pools, like connection pool, worker pool. These names may seem complicated at first, but when you get closer to them, they are all just a beautiful combination of simple points, which I would definitely dive into in my next videos. By the way, if you're new to this channel or Golang, I've already created some videos from the basics of Golang to here, which includes basics of Go, I mean, basic syntax, defining objects, error handling, basics of concurrency, and some of the videos. Check them out if you want to. Thank you so much for watching. Hit the like button if this video might help you. Don't forget to subscribe, be curious, and keep learning.